Why do we dedicate our lives to God? Like what, what we just did there. Like, why do we do this? It's a good question, isn't it? Why should we dedicate our lives to God is the question really we're asking. Um, now, I've, I've, I grew up in a Catholic home, but I never really would practice my Catholic faith. I mean, if you said to me, are you a Christian? I probably would have said yes, but I definitely didn't know Jesus and I wasn't a believer and I wasn't following Jesus. I never picked up my Bible. I was living my life completely for myself, getting smashed, getting drunk, going to nightclubs. I was a break dancer. I was in hip hop culture. Um, I got, I become a Christian, gave my life to God at the age of 19 years old. So up until then, I mean, I, if you said, do you, do you believe in God? I would have said, yeah, I believe in God. But, and I would have prayed at night time, like really short religious prayers. Father, our Father, one heaven, hell be nothing, but kingdom come, I will be done, I will be done, give us this day our daily bread. I just prayed it really fast and repetitiously. And actually Jesus says, don't do that. Don't pray repetitious prayers. Because God wants us to uh, have, the Father wants us to have a relationship with him. And I didn't know God. But then someone told me about Jesus and actually what he did for us. Now, growing up as a Catholic, going to Catholic church every now and then, Christmas and Easter, and when, whenever I had to, because my mum forced me to go, I would um, see Jesus dying on the cross, like the, the statue that is, and I'd, and I'd be hor- horrified as a little boy because he's got blood coming out of his hands and it's like a torture instrument. It's like, mum, why did Jesus die on the cross? Like, why did he have to die like that? And mum would say in Italian, uh, he died for our sins. But really, it went in one ear, went out the other ear, as the Italian saying goes. It goes in and goes out. I didn't know why Jesus died on the cross. I didn't have a revelation, didn't understand it until I became a Christian at the age of 19 when someone told me about Jesus. But then I went to church and I I experienced God's love and God's presence. I I was touched by people's love and friendliness. I, I didn't really understand the preaching, but I, I went to church on a Sunday, lived the same that week, didn't change. Went to church again another Sunday. Then on that Monday, that's two Sundays in church, that Monday in my bedroom by myself where there's no one around, no one praying for me, no one trying to hype me up or anything like that, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit came inside of me. And from that moment, I won't go into the details, it changed and transformed my whole life. I actually was given purpose for life. I started to realize why I was created. I started to realize why I exist. I mean, I used to ask questions when I was a young man, 18, 19 years old. And I'd think, why? This is after nightclubs, after breakdancing, after, you know, being in the limelight. And and, and we were one of the good good breakdancers in those days, in the 80s. And did shows, did stuff on TV, did film clips. And so I had a bit of limelight and that. But at night time, it was empty. Light time, I'm, I'm just by myself. And I'm, there's this loneliness and emptiness. And I, and I think, God, why, why are we here? What's the purpose of life? Why do I exist? These questions. And sometimes tears would roll down my face because it's emptiness, it's loneliness. You know, you got drunk, you got smashed, you got dope and drugs or whatever you do. And, and, but now I'm by myself thinking and asking the questions that we should be asking why are we here. Who am I? Where am I going? I believe God's word clearly teaches these things. Absolutely clearly. At the age of 19, all those questions were answered and put God, the Lord God, by his love and grace, put me on the right track of knowing him. Right? And so number one reason why we should dedicate our lives to God, there's a number of reasons. I actually probably can give you a hundred reasons, but I'm not going to do that to you today. I reckon, I reckon there's hundreds, even thousands of reasons we should. But I'll, I'll try to stick to six if I can get to six. But one of the things is because God is our Father. Now, most people don't see God as a Father. But God is not just a Father, but He's a loving Father. If you actually understood that God is a, a, a loving, generous, joy-filled Father who smiles over you, there are some scriptures that says that God rejoices with song over you and he twirls out of joy. He sings and dances over you. God is a father and, and, and they actually crucified Jesus and attacked Jesus and persecuted Jesus, ridiculed Jesus constantly because he called God his father. 
Because he brought the revelation that God's not just some far out God that doesn't have nothing to do with us. He is intimately involved in your life and actually knows even the hairs of your head. And if you comb your hair this morning and some fell out, he even knows how many, how many hairs left. You know, in other words, he's intimately involved about your life. Some, some it's pretty easy for God, hey, that we don't, <laughs> to know how many hairs you got left. But, but he knows everything. That told me, Jesus said those words. Jesus says, God knows the hair of your head. What's he trying to say? God knows everything about you. God is a father. He loves you. Something about a father is that fathers would do anything for their children. Anything. If, if it was possible, now I'm just saying if it was possible, because it's not. If your child was dying of some sort of terminal disease and was suffering with pain and was slowly dying, if it's possible for you to take it as a dad, you would take it. Most fathers would do it. If you, if you got any, because see, this father heart of, if you're a dad, if you're a father and you're a dad of your children, the father heart is a reflection of God's father heart. We can father because God fathers. He put that in us. We're made in, in his image. But we're, we're, we're offsprings of God. The Bible actually says God made us in his image, in his likeness. So the reason why we can love like a father, da, father God does is because God put that in us. So if, if, if I could, if God forbid one of my kids were dying of some sort of painful, crazy disease, and if I could take their place and take the disease, I definitely would. I heard stories where, where our father gave his heart to his little son. He, so he dies and the son stayed alive. I saw, I saw one where a, a, a son, a grown-up son, was, was riding a bull. He falls right off and the father comes out of the, out of the sort of gate area, cr- the crowd, jumps on his father, protects his, uh, jumps on his son and protects his son while the bull comes and gorges the bull came and gorged the dad, but the father protected him with his body. Instantly, like it was all in a few seconds, the father's willing to put down his body on the line and cop the hit. And now you, know, you think, well, is that how God is? It's exactly what God is. It's exactly what God did in Jesus. Most people don't know Jesus. They don't know, well, why did Jesus die? Why, did Jesus, why was Jesus born of a virgin? Why was he even come to the planet Why? because God became a man and dwelt among us lived among us lived a perfect life without any sin but then Jesus willingly on purpose planned purpose by God and Jesus fulfilled the plan of God to die on the cross what did he do he was taking the pain of the bull he was taking the hit of the bull of judgment because we're going to face God, but Jesus took it for us so that we don't have to face the judgment of God. He was judged as if he was the sinner, but he never sinned. So he could consume the judgment of God. So that's why it's called good news. That sounds like good news. That some, God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins? Religion tells you, clean up your life, give up this, give up that, don't do this, go to church, give money to the poor, do this, do that, do this, pray this way, pray that way, don't do that, don't touch that. Religion says that. God, Christianity, what Jesus represents. Jesus says, I've done it all for you. Everything. You can't do a thing to earn it. Just accept. Just believe. Because it's in the believing that changes you from the inside out. It's in the believing that makes you then want to do good. That's so powerful. That's the key. The, The good news of seeing God, the Father, as a loving Father. Many of us don't understand the, father, the, love, the love of the Father. Matthew 7, Jesus is trying to tell these guys when he walked the earth. And I love the way he uses this, this picture. Matthew 7. In Matthew? Yeah. He says, basically he's saying, ask and you, you, know, ask and you shall receive. That's verse, in, verse um, 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and you shall receive. Give it, uh, uh, sorry, knock and the, the door will open. Um, yeah. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will open. For everyone who asks receives. Now when you ask and keep on asking, you'll receive. When you seek and keep on seeking, you will find. When you knock and keep on knocking, you, the door will be open to you. And look what he says. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf of bread or some food will give him a stone? And what father among you, if your son is hungry, asks you as a dad, can you give me some bread, give me some food? Would you give him a stone? I mean, of course not. That's what Jesus is trying to say. If you, he goes, or if, 
he's hungry and asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? Would you give your son a snake that can hurt them? Of course not. Jesus says, if you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? What's he saying? You, you p- People, human beings that are fallen from God, separated from God, with, with, with the, you know, he says, you being evil, know how to give good gifts. A father just knows. I've never, ever been tempted to give my sons or my children stone as a dad. Never. I mean, that would be weird, wouldn't it? That would be pretty wicked. I'm going to give him a stone instead. We don't have that evil in us. We just always want to give him food. And Jesus is trying to change our thinking about God. God's a good God. If you ask him for something, he wants to give you good things. So why wouldn't we want to run to him? Why wouldn't we want to give our lives to him? When you see God that way, you go, why, why haven't I given my life to God earlier? Because I didn't believe the good news. I believed lies about God. I thought that if I became a Christian, I have to give up this and give up that and give up this. I give up my whole life and then oh, I get followed. When I used to think of Christians when I was a non-believer, when I was not a Christian, I used to think of Christians, I could never live like that. I can't live my life like that. They're two good issues. They go to church. They read their Bibles. I can't do that. And the reality is I couldn't and neither can you. It's only when God changes your heart that you start living for him out of love. But he actually gives you, he, he teaches you how to live life the best way possible. So it just if you can only understand the, if we can only understand the father heart of God, we'd be running to him, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I love my children so dearly. And I'll do anything for them. If you're a father, you probably think the same way. First time I I held Leon in my arms, I thought to myself, I've got to live for him now. I've got to live for him, not for myself. See, when you don't have children, you you just have to think about yourself, selfishness. When you've got children, all of a sudden, I've got to live for them. I've got to lay down my life for them. That's how the father thinks. Our father God in heaven. And number two is because God is love. Oh, if we can only understand this. God is, the Bible actually says, God is love. Not that God has love from time to time. God is love. And if you understood this, uh, this is something that I believe with all my heart is true for every single person on the planet that's alive today. I believe with all my heart, this is the message of the gospel, that if you're the only person left on the planet, if there was no one else to die for, if there was no one else to, to die that cruel death on the cross, Jesus from heaven, God would have become a man through a virgin birth, lived 33 years the way he did, lived perfectly obedient to God without sin, then die that cruel death on the cross just for you if you were the only person left on the planet. See, what we do, we think, well, you know, there's 8,000 million people on the planet. There's 8 billion people on the planet. Plus, there's been thousands of people, that are, millions of people that have lived since 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth. And I mean, I'm just a number. I'm just one person. I'm just, who am I? And we, we dilute the love of God. And we dilute the commitment of His love towards you. I'm telling you with all my heart, if you're the only person left on this planet, no one else to die for just for you, He would have done it for you. That's how valuable you are to Him. That's how special you are to Him. That's where you get your self-worth from. That I, I am so valuable to God that He would have done it for me. You know, one time I'm talking to the Lord and I'm speaking to Him. I say, Lord, talk, talk to me, speak to me. Uh, just tell me something. And he said to me, Leo, if you're the only person on the planet to love, there's no one else to love. Because sometimes we think God wastes, God um, is running out of time or running out of energy, running out of his affection and attention towards me because he's got to love 8,000 million people on the planet. But the Lord said, if you're the only one to love, no one in heaven, no one on earth, just you. He said, I wouldn't love you any more than I already do now. So that's pure love. So how do you, or else we think like, we think God's like a human. We think that if there's no one else to love, then he'll, he's got to love everybody else. He gives a bit of of his heart away to everybody. He's only got a little bit left for you. No, he loves you. He can't love you any more than he already loves you now. He's in love with you. But a lot of us don't know what love is because he can love you. And still be holy and have to judge you at the same time. 
We just think, oh, love means no matter what I do, he's just going to accept me. No, don't get confused with justice. God is a God of justice, righteousness, and he has to be holy and perfect and judge. The world's confusing what love is right now, completely. But God is love. We do need to know that he absolutely loves us. Number three is God is good. See, if you, if you and I just actually believed God is good, the Bible actually says when it talks about the nature of God and what he's like, this is what it says in 1 John. God is light, and in him, in God, there is no darkness at all. Not a shadow of turning, not a, not a blink of darkness, just light. What, what is God saying? God is love, and in him there's no selfishness at all. God is joy, and in him there's no depression at all. God is faith, and in him there's no fear at all. There's, there's, there's not, um, what's the word? The world of the good and evil and the, um, yin, 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 yang. That's just not about God. That God's good and evil. No, God is good. Completely. But most of it's understand. Peace and no despair in the heart of God. God has never had a worried thought in his life, in his eternal being. He's never ever thought, oh no, what's going to happen in World War III? Russia's attacking Ukraine. Oh no, oh no, what am I going to do? Never has God ever thought like that. Full of peace. No despair whatsoever. God is good and there's nothing in God that will want to harm you. There's Jeremiah, verse 25. Most of us know this as believers, but Jeremiah, verse 25, says, For I know, this is what God says, For I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts for good and thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you hope and a future. God has thoughts of good, not evil, thoughts of peace. Think about it, not, not evil, not to harm you, but to give you a good future. Then Psalms 139, we haven't got time to look at it, but if you want to look it up in your own time, Psalms 139 actually says that all the days that are ordained for you and I were written in God's book before any of those days came to be. You know what that means? There's a book in heaven about your life. God has, again, you've got to believe the Bible. Don't, don't work it out in your brain. Work it out, understand it in your heart. God has, for every person that's ever lived on this planet, books in heaven, and he's written out your life. Every day ordained for you were written in your book before any of those days ever came to be. There's a book that God has written about your purpose and plans, and they're all good things. But why wouldn't you want to give your life to a God who's full of love, full of wisdom, full of joy, full of amazing purpose, and he's got a book in heaven for your life, for your purpose? I, as a young man, I found out that, that that's true. And I'm just excited about finding out what's your plan. What's your plan? What's your purpose? Surely your plans are going to be adventurous, exciting, full of love, full of joy, full of peace, full of kingdom power. It's going to be greater than what I could do in my life. So there's a lot to say about God's goodness. I, I, I have been extremely, extremely blessed by God since I gave my life to the Lord at the age of 19. I, I, I can tell you, miracle after miracle, provision after goodness. I'm married to a beautiful wife. I've got five beautiful children. I've got a second grandson coming along any day. He's overdue already by now. But, but, but I'm just blessed, 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 blessed. But God's done that. I, I, I'm telling you, if I kept, if I kept the, my hands on the wheels of my life, like steering, I would have destroyed my life after a few years. Because I, got, I became a Christian at 19. A few years, I would have destroyed my life. I've got about four of my very best friends that are dead. That's the type of road we were, right, we were walking on. Four of my very best friends. I can name every single one of them. They were my best friend and they're no longer with us. But God put us, or me and my family and many people around us, on the right track. You know, God is only a good God. Now, when God created the earth, I, if I can just in a nutshell tell you this. When God made the earth, he made it perfect, abundance, there's no sin, there's no death on the planet, there's no winter, no, no, no summer, like it, it was a greenhouse effect. This earth was a perfect paradise in the, in the garden and God put the crown of his creation, even the sun, the moon, the stars, all minister to the earth and then God puts the crown of his creation. He spoke everything into existence but he made Adam with his hands, intimacy, 
And he shaped Adam from the dirt and then breathed into Adam the breath of life. And when God went, the very breath of Adam came from God, perfect without sin, in the image of God, in the likeness of God, Adam and Eve. This is God's intention for mankind, without sin. In other words, they're walking in faith, no fear, joy, no depression, love, no selfishness. This is walking like God in God's image. We lost that terribly through disobedience. The, a big fall, it was like what we call the separation from mankind, Adam and Eve, and God. And everyone that was born after Adam and Eve was born in a sinful nature. It, it, the Bible refers to it as spiritual death. In other words, we have a spirit that lives in this body, but it's dead to God. It, it, it's been trained to do the opposite of what God wants us to do. It's been trained to operate in fear and unbelief and depression, anxiety, stress. All these things, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, hatred, actually weren't designed by God for us to live in those things. But we, we just, all, it's, it, it's become almost natural. It's normal. Everyone does it. It's true. Until you come to Christ. When you come to Christ, God, that dead spirit, he basically wants to resurrect that dead spirit and bring it to life. So God doesn't just make bad people good. He makes dead people alive. We were spiritually dead. He made us alive. That's the born again phrase that you might have heard. Have you been born again? Oh, you, you, you know, Jesus actually coined that phrase. You must be born again or you can't enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee, like a high priest, like a religious leader. And he says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he go back into his mother's womb and be born when he's an adult? And Jesus says, nah, what, what is born of physical is physical. You're talking about the flesh. That's the physical part. But what is born of spirit is spirit. So he's talking about the spirit. Your spirit has to be born from above, from God. And the reason why we can be is because someone took the penalty for us. It took God 4,000 years of prophesying in the Old Testament, prophesying after prophet, prophet, for Jesus to be born through a virgin, then live a perfect life, then die on the cross in our place as us. He took the judgment of God as a human being representing mankind. Isn't that good news? Because then, then he, was, he was buried. But because he had no sin, the devil couldn't keep him dead. Three days later, he got resurrected and defeated death for all of mankind. That puts their faith in him. So when you and I give our lives to Jesus and actually believe that Jesus died on the cross, our dead spirit gets resurrected and we're made alive with Christ. There's heaps of New Testament scriptures that says you were dead, but he made you alive. And now you are raised with him, seated with him, made alive with him, resurrected with him, seated at the right hand of God. We're seated with Christ above all the, the evil of this world. We're seated above it and we can now fellowship, connect, relationship with God. And it takes a lifetime to relearn how to live life. Christians aren't perfect. Christians have been forgiven. And Christians have this gift of right standing with God. Isn't that good? Right standing. I have the ability and you have the ability, if you accept Jesus, to have a right standing relationship with God. Not on my merit, not, on, not, not what I have done, but what he has done. See, most people think, oh, Leo, how, how, how good do I have to be to be forgiven? This is how most people think. If I went out in the streets right now and said, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Oh, be a good person, you know. Do good. Usually we think, I used to think this way, um, the good that I do has to outweigh the bad that I've done. Because we've all done bad. So we think, well, surely God's going to look at the bad and then he's going to look at the good. And maybe the good will outweigh the bad. You can't get into heaven that way. It's impossible. That's trying to get to heaven in your own good works. That's like saying, how good do I have to be? Well, the reality is you have to be 100% perfect with no one can. See, if I stood before God in my own merit, my own goodness, I'm undone and I am lost and I will be judged and I won't make it in. But if I stand before God because of Jesus, he's my mediator, he's my intercessor, he's like the lawyer that stands between God and me. And because of him, I go in. Does that make sense? That's what, that's what a believer is. That's what a Christian is. The other points that I did have, which I'm not going to get into now, is that he gives us, mm, number four was... He is the creator. And because he's the creator, he gives purpose to everything he creates. There's a scripture that says he was, we were born 
So all things were created by God and for God. There's your reason for living right there. You were created for God. Think about that. Most people don't know why they exist. What do I exist? You, I'll tell you why you exist, to have a love relationship with God. Amen. To actually love the Father. That's your purpose for life, is to be reconnected to your Creator. Everything God creates has a purpose. Everything. Absolutely everything. From, the tr- from trees has a purpose. It, it, it creates fruit, but also gives that, takes on the carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. The, 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 the clouds has purpose, the water, the ocean, the rivers. Everything has purpose. Everything you can imagine. The bee has purpose. God doesn't just create a bee to go and do nothing. It's got purpose. Everything God's created. People used to think tons- not, not tonsils, the appendix had no purpose until we caught up a little bit with God's wisdom and realized it actually does something in the body. God wouldn't put tonsils in your throat for no purpose. There's a purpose for that. I grew up, people say, oh, there's no real purpose. You can take it out. No, it, it protects you for the incoming germs and bacteria. God has put purpose for everything. So what, what's the purpose for man? Relationship with God. Why is there so much confusion out there? Because they don't have a relationship with God. And why are they now losing their because they don't know their identity once you know your purpose you get to know your identity my purpose is to be a son of of God your purpose is to be a son or daughter of God that's my identity now I don't have to get confused about my identity I'm sorry but please hear my heart I I, I came back from Melbourne and female toilets I'm looking for the males all gender toilets oh that's strange I started thinking all gender they actually done it how unwise, how, how foolish have we become? All gender toilet. And then there was a male toilet. And someone was cleaning in there. And it was blocked. I said, oh, is it open? oh no, no, it's closed. Oh, I go down the other one. In other words, the all gender one. I just thought, that's okay, I'll wait. <laughs> I won't even go. I'm not even going to bother. Go. I would have went if I was busting, but I could wait. But all gender toilet. It's like, come on. How, how, how have we fallen so far? There's not just one, two, three, four genders. There's supposed to be, there's so many so-called hundreds of different... It's just, we've lost it. And that someone just has to call something for what it is. It's falling away from truth. Falling away from our identity. And what God has done for us. Amen? Amen? God brings us back to identity. The last one was that God is a judge. And it, there is scripture that says that we will stand before God. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone, even if you're not a believer, one day you'll stand before Jesus, stand before the, the, the judgment seat of God, the great white throne judgment if you're not a believer, and you will confess that he's God. Then you'll give an account of your life. And without Christ, we will be separated from God for all eternity. It's a place called hell. It's like a prison. We put people in prison today. Well, there's a place called hell that separates people because heaven won't be heaven if you take anyone into heaven that has not been born again. But God has created an answer, a solution. The good news is someone took the penalty for you and it's free. It's free for us, but cost him everything. So it doesn't mean it's not costly. It's costly. It's free. Because you just accept it for free. I don't have to do anything. Just believe. Oh, but what about if I... No, just believe. What about if I just do good things? Uh, just believe. What about if I just believe? And at that point, you're forgiven and a child of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Now, I, I, I want to give us an opportunity, one, to, to believe, to say yes to him. But this provision of God in the gospel, Jesus paid the penalty for sin, sickness, disease, addiction, Mental problems, anxiety, worry, depression, heart, um, what do you call it, um, when you're wounded, broken dreams, brokenness. God, Jesus wants to heal everything. So we want to provide a place where you can receive a miracle even in your heart. Some people have been so broken hearted, they don't want to trust again and they can't trust again. They don't know how to trust again. They don't know how and they just shut down. God can heal you today of that. But it starts with saying yes to Jesus. And if you have sickness in your body, terminal disease, whatever, God can heal you. God's the healer. He really is. 
We've seen many, many miracles over the, over the uh, years of walking with him. So as our, if we can just pray this, I'm going to ask you to say yes to him. You're first saying, yes, I want to be a Jesus follower. I want to be a disciple of Jesus and I want to give him my life and I want to follow him. The, if you've got questions, that's fine. You can ask more questions. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to, you know, you might think, Billy, I don't know if I'm ready. Well, I wasn't ready. I just gave my life to him. And little by little, he changed me more and more. So if there's anybody in this room, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Just in case there's people that need to make peace with God. If you were to die, you don't know for sure if you have a relationship with God. You don't know for sure where you would go. Would I go to heaven? Would I go to hell? Would I make it? If you've got those questions, God can forgive you of all that, all those sins. And let Him be the one that stands before God for you. Just slip your hand up right now. Just say, yes, Leah, pray for me. I'm going to pray a prayer where you accept Jesus into your life. It's a beautiful thing. It's a simple thing. It's a powerful thing. And it changes you. Puts you on the right track. Just slip your hand up. We'll pray for you. I want to make sure there's people in this room that need to make peace with God. Just do that. It's a beautiful thing. Magnificent. God will accept you. Thank you, Father. You know, if you have questions, talk to another believer. Say, I still have some questions. I still need to ask about this. What about this? It's, it's good to search. It's good to seek out. It's good to say, I, I think I want to be a Christian, but I still got this question. Then talk to someone about it. If something is stirred up to you, I know I've got something missing. I need it. Then ask someone about it. Ask a believer. Ask your friend that, that does know Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to pray. Father, thank you for your goodness in sending your son, Jesus, for all of humanity. He is the answer. As Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's your words, Jesus. And I thank you that you have brought billions of people into your kingdom when they put their faith in you. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that we would grow closer to you day by day. We fall more and more in love with you and we'll have intimate love relationship with our Father in heaven. Lord, if there is any sickness, any disease, any pain, any heart, uh, broken hearts, or anxiety or stress or depression, I break the power of that in the name of Jesus. Right now, I break it off your mind. I command that to leave off of your mind right now. You might have come in with depression. You might have come in with anxiety or stress. I break it off your life now in Jesus' name. And I speak peace over your life, joy, and the love of the Father. Father, we thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name.